Well, good morning, everybody. I would uh, hope everybody's not feeling too badly the ill effects of the evening's parties. Uh, I commend all of you for coming to a crypto talk at 9 a.m. Um, I will try not to make it too terrible. Uh, before I get started, what I'd really like to find out is some of the, uh, the backgrounds, kind of like a general idea, so I know what I need to explain, and I don't want to explain things that everybody already knows. So, super, like, who knows what Base64 is? Okay, most of you, okay. Um, who's used cryptography, but they're not quite sure if they're doing it right? Okay, good, that's the, that's the crowd I prefer. <laughs> um, and who's super awesome and just here to audit me and tell me I'm wrong? It's okay, you can raise your hand, like I need people like you. Nobody? Okay. All right, so about myself, I'm a virtual crime fighter. I work for a company called Iovation here in uh, Portland. Uh, we are a security and fraud uh, risk analysis company. Uh, I'm also an IoT guy, which is awesome. Um, this is actually the first Linux-based IoT project I built, which was an access system using one of our, uh, one of our products uh, to do uh, physical access. Um, what I'm not is I'm not a security researcher. Um, I work for a security researcher, uh, excuse me, researcher. Um, I have some experience in security research as far as penetration testing and understanding things that go on, but that is not what I do day in and day out. I'm also not a cryptographer. I do not have a doctorate's degree in mathematics, and I do not study math. Um, I'm also not a mathematician, as that says. Um, being a cryptographer requires you to be a mathematician. Cryptography is just math. Uh, what to expect from what we're going to talk about is my hope is that you will gain an understanding of common terms in cryptography. Um, there are some misconceptions about certain of the certain terms. Um, and most importantly, understand the key drivers for choosing cryptography, uh, methodologies, algorithms, and strengths. Uh, a lot of times, uh, depending on what language you're using and how old it is, um, if you're using cryptography functions, the defaults may not be good. Um, if you're using JavaScript, it's not too bad, but if you're using some older stuff, like um, depending on, like Java doesn't even give you options on what's good or bad. Uh, but you know, if you're using Python, you may or may not have a good option as a default. Um, and to know what stuff to use. I should not say PHP. I apologize. <laughs> um, I actually gave this talk in a bunch of different languages. Uh, the last one I gave it in was PHP, and I forgot to change that. So cryptography, for uh, I guess a lot of you have some, at least some idea what cryptography is, but it's the practice and study of techniques for, sec for secure communications and the presence of third parties called adversaries, right? That's a great uh, Wikipedia definition. Um, but what that really means is, is you're trying to obscure data in such a way that it's difficult and therefore costly. Notice it does not say impossible. It says difficult and costly uh, for an adversary to duplicate or reverse. No cryptography is foolproof. Time avails us all. Uh, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to make it very difficult and very costly and make uh, an adversary have to decide whether they're willing to spend the amount of computing resources necessary to hack your data. So who are your adversaries? <clears throat> so all of us have the same adversary, which is the lone gunman, right? This is the famous 400 pound hacker on his bed. Um, this is just somebody who is, it's a hobbyist, it's someone who loves to crack things just to be cracked. Um, these are puzzle solvers. They just get joy out of breaking things. Um, they usually don't follow the rules and let you know before they tell everybody else that they found a problem with your software. Um, hacktivist groups, um, most of us have probably heard of anonymous. <clears throat> These are people that believe that someone is doing something that shouldn't be being done. Um, and those live on both sides of the political spectrum and the, uh, what some people might consider um, right and wrong. Uh, so everyone is always at risk to a hacktivist group because you're always upsetting somebody. Um, competitors. Uh, especially in the device world, industrial espionage, um, being able to find what your users are doing, who your users are, what they're doing, um, and also be able to expose exploits so that they can say that your product is not as good as theirs. Uh, organized crime, uh, not so much on devices, but if, you're, if you have accounts where people manage their devices, <clears throat> getting information out of there uh, that they might be able to use for some sort of exploitation or fraud uh, and extortion. Um, being able to follow what they do, where they go, and determine, oh, 
based on this, we find this person goes to this, you know, this hotel every six days. I wonder what he's doing there. And they find out and they, uh, they extort. It's actually, it's a real, it's a real thing that happens. And nation states. Um, nation states, including our own, or if you're a United States resident, um, they do a lot of data farming. They just collect all the data that they can. And they have a lot of very sophisticated software that puts all that data together, tries to find patterns, and tries to identify things. Um, they also try and uh, steal credentials. If you have a password on your, if you have uh, like a web interface or a way that you have a password, 60% uh, of the individuals on the planet use the same password for everything. So if they get the password to your device, they now have the password to their email, which means they have the password to their bank account, which means they have the password to their wherever they need to go. Um, the usernames and the passwords are normally the same. Um, and if the passwords aren't the same and they capture your email, you can do a password reset, right? Um, so those, that's really who your adversaries are. And in the first beginning, I talked about cost. So in cryptography, we're trying to increase the cost. And there's three things that really contribute to cost. Those are secrets um, and the level of those secrets and, and how large they are and how uh, random they are. Um, entropy, um, which is, uh, we'll, we'll talk a lot about what entropy is, and entropy is a huge part of, uh, uh, of cryptography, and that's perceived randomness throughout the data. And then computation, how expensive is it to actually uh, encrypt the data, how expensive is it to hash the passwords or to hash the data that you want to uh, secure. And so that brings us to how secret is secret. So there's two different types of encryption that are commonly used, which are asymmetric encryption and uh, symmetric encryption. So asymmetric encryption has no shared secrets, and we'll talk more about what asymmetric encryption is. Um, so because of that, it's inherently more secure. You don't have to trust somebody with your secret. Um, how predictable is your secret? So if you, you know, if your secret is um, your serial number or your secret is something that was generated based on time, if you're storing real-time data, uh, if you can determine what that secret is based on a random generation that is time-based, um, if you're doing it on a computer and they know the operating system and the hardware, they can recreate it. It's actually kind of scary. Um, who has access to your secrets? Um, and are, you, are your secrets encrypted at rest, right? If you have credentials on your systems, uh, on your devices, are you encrypting those when they're sitting on the file system or are you assuming that no one can just get to the file system? On a Linux-based system, that is a bad assumption to make. Uh, and are your secrets encrypted in transit? So if you're sending across a shared secret, are you using encryption to protect that as it goes across the wire? Are you, uh, are you using TLS or using SSL when you're transmitting data across the wire? Um, and if you don't have that option, if you're using a, a, a small protocol, are you, that doesn't provide something like SSL, are you actually encrypting important data that's going across? Stuff that should not be able to be viewed. And computational cost. So complexity of the algorithm increases the cost. So uh, a few years ago, <clears throat> when uh, I was first starting to learn cryptography for uh, financial technology systems, um, there's this thing called triple DES, because it was the DES, and then that wasn't safe enough, so if you do it three times, you get triple DES three times the size of the key. Um, and that was perfectly okay, because that, that was secure. Well, today that's not secure, because it's not complex enough. In the last seven years, the, uh, the emergence of ASICs and using GPUs to uh, process mathematics, which they're very good at, they were specifically built for that, um, to hack and crack uh, passwords and cryptography has made it a really horrible, terrible game so that a lot of the old uh, protocols and the uh, cryptography uh, algorithms are not valid anymore. Um, and there are some algorithms that specifically target memory and thread utilization to increase cost. So a lot of your modern uh, cryptography algorithms, especially when you're talking about password hashing, you get into something like an Argon 2i, uh, you tell it how many threads you want it to use and how much memory. Um, so it actually increases the amount of time it takes to, <clears throat> to hash uh, to hash your values because it uses a memory space larger than the address for the CPU. So the CPU has to do two calculations to, to deal with that memory. Um, and then feedback loops. That's really um, either side, whether it's going to be a, um, a block level encryption for uh, encrypting or if that's going to be uh, a key derivation function for passwords. So I hope nobody's totally confused right now, but the things we just, I just put in here, we're going to talk a lot more in depth here in just a second. 
So what is entropy? So entropy is the key to cryptography. <clears throat> uh, Merriam-Webster has a fairly, fairly good definition, which is the degree of disorder or uncertainty in a system. And that sounds a little odd to be talking about computer systems with disorder and uncertainty. But if you have certainty, if, someone can, if you have predictability, then you're easy to crack. And you don't want that. So here is a really good uh, example of entropy, of good entropy. So if you take a look at both of these, both of these are the same thing. One is encrypted, one is not. All right, so this is Tux. Everybody loves Tux, especially since we're in an embedded Linux conference. Um, and there is no way, I mean, I've actually tried staring at it, right? You do the whole, if you've ever been to like, I'm, I'm old. If you look, they have these things in the mall where you can look at it and stare and find a picture. You might find some pictures. And I have found like three or four different things, but it's never been a penguin, all right? That's important. This is what's considered um, minimally secure today for cryptography. This is what was considered secure seven years ago, all right? That is encrypted, all right? That is encrypted using AES encryption, which is the advanced encryption standard. Um, but it's using a bad, uh, it's using a bad method, which is electronic cookbook. And so you can absolutely, number one, you can absolutely tell what this data is supposed to be. You can tell that that's a penguin. The other thing that you can tell is that you have a lot of data that's the same. So um, you have predictability for individual pieces of data, and then across the larger spec of the data for each one of the blocks, you also have predictability. And that's really bad because it's not very hard to break, right? I don't have to break those thousand pieces of white, I just have to break one. So the question that becomes is how do we achieve maximum entropy? Because that's really what we're looking for. And there's a very long word, and hopefully I don't mess up when I say it the whole way, cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generators. It's a very big word and a very weird term, but what you need to understand about computers and randomness is there's no such thing as randomness to computers. Computers, well, to standard computers, okay? If you get into some of the, uh, the stuff that's coming down the pipe that's, you know, billions of dollars, um, they have perceived randomness, uh, but there is no randomness in uh, a zero one bit computer. What it does is it, it actually has a list of, num of values that show no pattern themselves and determines what part of the list it's gonna start with. So that's when you actually ask it to generate a random number. Um, it's going to, uh, or a random set of data, it's going to go to a known list, find a random place to get that piece of data and get the number of bytes you tell it to. And if you're concerned, you should be. <laughs> okay, um, and if most, uh, most programming languages have it separated with a cryptographically secure random generator and a random generator. So if you're doing um, just plain old RAND on most of your uh, software, you're going to get something that can be determined. It's deterministic based on the time. So someone can, um, with a fairly decent level of accuracy, determine it's going to be one of these 100 values um, that could have been generated during this time period if you generated them, uh, which is kind of scary. Um, but Linux provides the ability for cryptographically secure random number generation uh, based on additional things on the computer at that time, right? So it's gonna add in the temperature of the CPU. It's gonna add in additional information that it has that is unique to that particular device at that particular time to add randomness. So if you've ever um, been told to access dev random to get random data, dev random pro provides random data. If you don't have access to that, if you've used OpenSSL, OpenSSL has a random number generator that does that as well. Um, so you add entropy with salts. So salt is adding randomness to known information. Um, it's just a randomly generated value, which again should be generated using a cryptographically secure random number generator. Feedback loops. So the difference between those two entropy examples, that was the difference of a feedback loop. And feedback loops creates a local randomness to block ciphers so that you take the value from one response, put it into the uh, encryption of the next response, so that even if you've got the same value, it doesn't come out the same twice, right? Um, salts for randomness for hashing, make sure that if you hash a password twice and you use, you use two different salts, it's not the same value, right? Uh, security researchers or hackers, black, white, or gray, uh, they all know what the top 100 passwords are. Uh, and they can go look at your data and determine if you don't use a random salt, they can actually determine which ones are using those top 100 passwords just based on the averages of what comes out. They have a fairly good idea that this one is gonna be either you know, one of these two or three passwords. You've now reduced the amount of time it takes them to crack it um, pretty drastically. 
And it's the same thing with encryption um, using the feedback loops. So initialization vectors add global randomness to block ciphers. So if you use uh, even a good block cipher mo uh, mode and you have inside of the data, you have good entropy from block to block to block. If you use the same initialization vector, every time you encrypt the word go, it will look the same. So uh, initialization vectors, the randomness there, allows you to have different values across your data sets. Um, and, and the reason for this is that all data, all data will have some predictability, right? There's some amount of uh, predictability in there as you can determine that, let's say for social security numbers, right? Well, the most common first number is what? I don't know what that is, but I bet if I did a Google search in about 20 minutes, I could tell you what the most common first number of social security number is. I could tell you what the most common first letter of an email address is, right? I can tell you what the most common last letter is, right? It's gonna be M. <laughs> um, so there are patterns in the data, and if you allow someone to determine, if you don't put that global entropy across your data, you're going to allow someone to get in there and determine that, oh, I got a good idea what this is, so I've got less that I have to do to try and crack it. Um, and some ciphers introduce randomness with padding. So that's done uh, on RSA. Um, it actually does randomness based on padding, not based on initialization vectors or anything like that. So it's a little bit different. And in entropy, the big thing we talked a little bit is local versus global, right? Local is making sure that your data from packet to packet, from block to block, has entropy. You don't have that, that definable um, vision of what the data is going to be. And then global is going to be across your larger data set. So using initialization vectors and salts are going to help you do it across the uh, entire system. And then again, like we talked earlier, how random is random? Um, it can be very random if you use the correct tools. If you use the wrong ones, it's not going to be. So in cryptographic systems, um, you have symmetric key cryptography, which uses shared secrets, and you have asymmetric key cryptography, which uses private public key pairs. Um, and you have something kind of in the middle, which is ECDH, um, which is um, you're defining different curves. Um, co most common ones that I'll talk about today, you can get into the elliptic curve stuff, um, but symmetric and asymmetric, you know, RSA, AES, those are the two most common. Those are available on nearly every platform, um, although ECDH is certainly becoming more available and more secure. And there's three types of cryptography applications we'll talk about today, which are encryption, digital signatures, and key derivation. So encryption is protecting data that needs to be recalled. You need to be able to uh, decrypt it so that you can see the value. You need to use that data for some reason. Um, digital signatures are used to verify the integrity of the data. So uh, it's used mostly for data transfer, but um, if, in my talk on Monday, I talked about you can use digital signatures as well to make sure that your, no one has gotten onto your file system and changed your data, changed your code. You can re-verify yourself before you run uh, as part of a startup uh, because that's actually something that's uh, unfortunately prevalent uh, in Linux-based IoT is leading SSH open, sewing and putting in, changing your code, putting in code that uh, you don't want to get run, but getting run anyway. Uh, and you can protect against that using digital signatures. Um, and it cannot be reversed. So you cannot, if you, take, if you take something secret in its plain text form and you sign it, you cannot take that signature to recreate the value. Uh, similar to a hash, right? Hashes cannot be decomposed, but you can recreate it to verify it. So when you create a digital signature, <clears throat> to verify that it is the correct signature, you take the information that you used from creating it the first time, do it a second time. If the data values match, then your signature is valid. Key duration. <clears throat> this is most times known as password hashing. Uh, I try not to use the word hashing because it uh, brings up memories of MD5 and SHA. Um, this is not MD5 or SHA. Although SHA is often used in key derivation functions, um, it's, it's not uh, the same thing. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, and it cannot be reversed. So again, like I said, same thing with a signature. You can't reverse it. You don't have to worry about that being out in the open. Um, and it's computationally expensive by design. So a SHA2 hash, even, whether, even if it's salted or not, is not expensive. Uh, key derivation functions are extremely expensive to reproduce. And that's uh, super important for your users. So we'll go through each one of the types individually. Uh, and the first one is symmetric key cryptography. You're probably fairly common, uh, fairly used to this. If you have like a password manager, it's using um, symmetric key cryptography. Um, if you 
if you have data at rest, most often you're, if you're putting in a database, um, if you've got encrypted data stores, those are using symmetry. If you've got an iPhone, right, or uh, an Android, and you've got a pin that you have to put in. Wow, thank you, Java, for telling me you have an update. I apologize. <laughs> that was crazy. Um, so if you, if you have those things, right, and you have, like, on, on the iPhone, it's your, your pin that you enter in to get into the device. That is your key, your shared secret for symmetric key encryption. So you're using symmetric key encryption all the time. You probably just don't know it. Um, it has lower computational costs than asymmetric, most asymmetric algorithms for the same key size. Uh, and it uses algorithms against blocks or streams of data. Most of us aren't going to be doing stream unless you're doing video streaming. But then again, you probably want to use a block that is a self-synchronizing stream anyway. Um, stream uh, asymmetric encryption is not very... Uh, secure because it doesn't take a lot to, to decrypt it. Um, so most implementations will use block because um, stream uses less resources, thus less computationally expensive, thus less secure. <clears throat> so the differences between streams and blocks is stream ciphers have to quickly encrypt streams, right? As the data is going by, real time, it's encrypting. Um, one portion of the stream does not affect the other, so it's, in, it's just encrypting it. You're not getting that global entropy we talked about because each particular packet going out is getting encrypted in its own way. Uh, block ciphers deal with one block at a time. These are probably the ones you're most familiar with. Uh, they're very secure as long as you're using the correct modes uh, because they allow for feedback loops. And that's uh, what the modes will give you to create entropy over the entire package. So for block algorithms, use AES. Um, if you're not sure what to use, Camellia, uh, Camellia can be used if it's required, but it does have um, restrictions due to patent. <clears throat> But most of the planet out there, if you're doing symmetric key encryption, you're using AES. Um, it is, you know, it is U.S. government approved. It is EU approved. It is uh, FIPS standard. It is the National Institutions of uh, Science and Technology approved. Um, that's what you want to use. A DES should not be used. Uh, some cryptographic uh, packages out there, DES is the default. You don't want DES. You really don't. Um, block cipher modes. <clears throat> So for AES, you're going to have block cipher modes. And do not use electronic cookbook. It sounds cool, the electronic cookbook. Um, it is often the default. <clears throat> ECB was once considered secure, but it is not. Big red, do not use ECB, do not use ECB, do not use ECB. And there'll be another slide later that says do not use ECB. Um, so block cipher modes determine how the blocks of clear text are translated into cipher text, right? It's just, it's the way that it does things. And we'll, we'll kind of talk about this a little bit. And the reason I'm saying that you use CBC is that the entire message is required for decryption. So you cannot decrypt the last piece without the first piece. So someone can't determine that I believe that the data that I need is more important on the end, so I'm just going to decrypt these last six blocks. That cannot happen, right? Um, and the reason for that is, and I won't get too much into it, is that if you notice here, what's going on is that it encrypts the data. So you start with an initialization vector. An initialization vector is needed because that's the way these things work with block cipher modes. And so you have a random value that you start with with your initialization vector. You encrypt the data, and then the, the, the initialization vector for the next packet is the encrypted value of the first packet. So every packet is going to be different, even if it's the same value, because it's putting the encrypted value and using that as a, in a feedback loop for the next one. So CBC is... Uh, pro, you know, the, the standard that gets used today. There's also GCM, um, which does it a little bit different. Um, it, it is using a feedback mode. It encrypts and generates authentication codes and return HMAC. And we'll talk about HMAC in a second, which is a digital signature. So it'll actually return the signature and the encryption at the same time simultaneously. So that can give you some advantage. Um, and whether or not what you're using is going to support it may be up in the air, but most of your more modern packages are going to support GCM as well. Um, so you can decide what's going to work for you, especially if you're just doing it locally. You don't care about transmission, but if you're transmitting data, you might care. Um, and as you can see, it is remote. It is completely different. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into the graphic. <laughs> if you want to take a look at all these graphics and how all this stuff works, um, Wikipedia. That's where these images come from. There's a ridiculous amount of information on cryptography on Wikipedia um, that will tell you how all this stuff works, but we don't have enough time to really get into that. <laughs> um, there's Cypher Feedback, which is a self-synchronizing Cypher stream. So if you're going to be doing streaming data, you probably want to use um, CFB. 
Uh, if you're doing audio streaming, what, you know, whatever streaming you might be using, Cypher feedback actually works fairly well. Um, so it's slightly different, not going to get into that, <laughs> but you can distinctly see that it is different on how it's generating things and it doesn't, it doesn't take as much time and you can start from the middle and go to the end. Right, so it's not as secure, but if you're doing streaming data that you want someone to be able to lose the data and then pick back up, you need something like a self-synchronizing screen, a stream. Um, output feedback uh, is again the same thing, which is very different, and this actually is if you need to be able to um, not slow down any data and always have the data um, working as you basically, um, sorry, picture's there. Um, so what this is going to allow you to do is you can actually pre-generate the top part. <laughs> so, and then you do an XOR with the bottom piece, your plain text, and it generates cryptography. So you have something that's a little computationally expensive to generate, but you can pre-generate those on both sides, starting with a common, uh, a common key and initialization vector. So you can pre-generate generate the information necessary to encrypt and decrypt, and then you can do an XOR to actually do that process on either side and get the data back out. So... It allows you, if you have things that are computing very quickly and can't be slowed down by encryption at all, but you need some sort of encryption, again, not as secure, but there are, you know, there's a pluses and minuses to each one of them. Very few, very few of you are going to need either of these last two, right? You're just not going to need them. Um, which brings us to digital signatures um, for the last thing in, in symmetric key cryptography. So an HMAC, which is a hash-based message authentication code, right? Um, you've probably used an HMAC before. Uh, you've probably seen HMACs before. Um, it's hashing combined with a key. So um, you're going to use, hopefully, uh, something SHA-256 or better. You're going to provide a key. It's going to do some math against those two and then hash that value. Um, so it's diff if you don't have the key, you cannot recreate the hash. So that's why it's symmetric keys. You both have to understand what the key is. You can verify the data coming across. It is very quick and it is fairly secure as long as you're using um, SHA-256 or better. And the reason that you want SHA-256 or better is um, for data collision. So, one second. Sorry. So when you're doing hashing, <clears throat> what you're doing is you're taking a lar usually a large piece of data and turning it into 16, 24, 32 characters. There's a lot of room for collision there, right? Especially if you have you know, a four megabyte file that you're now doing a SHA-256 um, hash of, and bringing that down to 24 characters. So um, the, the longer that your hash is going to be, the least likely that someone is going to be able to create something else that will have the same hash, because there are hash collisions. When you're storing data that's going to be um, in a format that you're expecting, that makes it a little more difficult, right? So if you, let's say you're taking some JSON and you want to sign that, the likelihood of someone being able to recreate another piece of JSON that has the, the same signature, it gets much more difficult, right? If it's just random data, that's much easier to find a collision. But if you're uh, trying to do something that is kind of readable through JSON, that makes it much more difficult, but not impossible. Um, so the, the longer that your, your hash string is going, to, uh, it's going to generate, the less likely you are to have collisions. The less likely it's going to be that somebody is going to be able to very, you know, in the amount of time that is allowable, be able to throw something out to a farm, generate something else with a new hash, and then ship it. Um, bad things can happen when people can do that. That's kind of nation state organized crime level, uh, but it is something to, to understand why the, the hashing is such a big deal and why the, the size of the hash actually matters. So, asymmetric key cryptography. This is. Uh, probably was the most secure now. So if you've ever done TLS, um, you've used um, asymmetric key cryptography. Um, so RSA and DSA are available um, in most languages, including PHP. So use RSA. Um, DSA was used because there were some uh, questions about copyrights and uh, patents for DSA, so RSA is what you want to use. Uh, it uses very large prime integers. So at an open Linux conference, if you're, if you're using Linux, you're probably okay. If you're using chips, you're in trouble. So you probably won't be able to use RSA. Um, one of the reasons that uh, the company I work for went to embedded Linux is because we worked for months to try and generate a single 1024 key, which is not secure, right? 1024 is not secure. Um, 
And we had to get special processors and all this type of stuff to generate that because it's a big integer, right? It's a very large prime number. And the computer just randomly generates numbers to determine if they're prime and trying to generate these prime numbers, very large prime numbers, 124 byte prime number. It's a very large prime number. I'm oh, sorry, 10, 1,024 byte. Um, so if you're, if you're doing stuff on chip, you probably aren't going to be able to do it. You probably aren't going to have the memory, um, let alone the, the uh, computational capacity. But if you're doing embedded Linux, you're probably okay, right? Um, your processor is going to be able to do that. It's not going to be able to do something on a, long, you know, on a large key. You're probably not going to be able to do a 4K key. Um, and that's just going to be based on your processor and what it can do and what its capabilities are, as well as the board. Um, even on mobile devices, you have that problem. So we do, uh, part of our security system has mobile devices involved. iPhone, generate a 4K key, no problem. Android, on a really good Android, takes 30 seconds. Um, so there are a lot of computation um, restrictions on using RSA. Uh, but because of that, it's what you want to use, right? Because we're trying to create things that are computationally expensive. RSA is very computationally expensive. So to be able to brute force that is very hard because you're constantly having to, let me go find a new prime number that's ridiculously large and try and see if that one is it. Um, it's, it's very hard. Um, and it uses key pairs to protect secrets, which is super, super important. That's what makes it super duper secret, right? Um, is that I don't have to trust you with the security of my secret. When you're using symmetric key cryptography, you pass the secret to someone else. It, it has to go in transit, whether that is physically going in transit or across the wire uh, or how, you know, some other out of band process. <clears throat> the secret is then able to be collected as it goes along. Uh, and you're trusting that wherever it's going is going to be secure, right? So if you have a secret from a device going to your, your cloud service, it's going through a lot of things you don't have any control over. It's being stored on a, uh, on a uh, file system that you may have done your best to secure, but someone has that file system, right? They have that device. They can just jack into it with a terminal and try and break into it if you're using embedded Linux, right? So the, uh, Using private public key pairs, although a little more difficult, a little more complicated, you only have, you don't have enough uh, ability to, um, I can't act as you and encrypt. I don't have your secret, right? Each of us have our own secret and we have enough information to encrypt things for each other, but not, I can't decrypt the data for you. I can only encrypt it for you. Uh, crazy computational math. It gets pretty crazy. Um, yes. Well, you, you have to encrypt multiple times for multiple public keys. Okay, so the, the original thing files get bigger, right? Right. You duplicate the encryption for each recipient. Right, so what he's asking is, because I have to repeat this for the cameras, um, if, you're, if you're having to encrypt for multiple recipients. Um, so one of the things that we use a lot is Jose, um, and it provides the ability for multiple recipients. But because everyone's keys are different, everyone's private keys are different, you have to encrypt it each time for each recipient. Um, which, is, which means it's super secret, right? So that means that you're not, not everybody, I can't read your data, and I can't read your data, and I can't read your data, I can only read my data. Even though I'm passing along all the data for everybody, you can, I can only read my own data that I'm supposed to be able to get, which is why, again, it is super duper secret. That's your question? Cool. Um, key sizes and hashing algorithms. So on asymmetric key encryption, the current minimum recommended size is 2048. And all of us should know that because we, if you've ever had a website or in the last year, your browser started giving little yellow warnings about this site does not have a, um, a secure enough um, SSL certificate. That was because it was using a key, a private key shorter than 2048. Um, again, higher is better, right? So 2048 is the minimum. It is secure today. If you have something that might exist, right? Devices are going to exist likely more than um, a few days. Um, they may exist uh, for a long time and you may not be able to um, have a really good patch uh, system for people to update it and people may not be able to update their, uh, their, their software or their firmware. So think about the future. If you can do 4096 keys, uh, which is it's more than, it's, it's much, much, much um, exponentially better, uh, do that if you can. Uh, protect for the future. But 2048 is what's going to be 
the minimum that's considered safe. And I know on devices, it's much more difficult and you may only be able to get 1024, but you're gonna be more secure in a 1K RSA key than you are with a 1K AES key, I promise you. The issue though is data limitations. So RSA can only encrypt or sign data up to the length of the key size. Most IoT, probably not a problem because we're using very small pieces of the data. We don't like to use a lot of radio. We don't want to use a lot of data. We don't want to spend a lot of time encrypting, decrypting, moving things along. Um, but if you're talking about moving larger amounts of data or anything that's going to be larger than your key, um, oftentimes what you end up doing is you end up using mixed mode where you will, and we actually do this a lot, is that you will encrypt something using a um, random key and a random initialization vector for AES and then you encrypt the key <laughs> that you use for AES using RSA. So it's always gonna be smaller than your key size. Um, AES is fairly quick, fairly secure, and it's way more secure when your key is different every time. Um, that's one of the advantages of the Jose library. It kind of does all that for you. Um, and I think I have a slide here about Jose in a little bit. Um, but signatures will just hash it, right? So again, you want to use a SHA hash when you're doing that, preferably a SHA-256 hash for collisions. Um, Although I have read, although I'm not, I'm, I'm skeptical about whether or not RSA doesn't need the, the SHA-256 for, uh, for doing its hashing. <clears throat> so padding. Uh, padding is how RSA creates additional entropy, which is kind of weird. And I didn't know this until like a year ago. Um, so the padding mode that you select in most cryptography doesn't necessarily matter, right? Just as long as both of you know what the padding technology is, right? You're encrypting in block cryptography in, ace, in symmetric key cryptography, you just have to make sure the blocks are always the size of your key. So you have to add extra data on the end. And how you do that is different. Um, sometimes you'll use null padding. Sometimes you'll use um, some of the different algorithms that are out there for just adding padding so that you know which parts are pad and which parts aren't. Um, but in RSA, it's actually, it actually changes the cryptography. So what you want to make sure you're using is you want to use the optimal asymmetric encryption padding, OAEP, if you're using RSA. Um, a lot of libraries have PKCS1, V15, I hope that's still readable on the bottom on the red. Um, it is no longer considered cryptographically secure. It seems a little weird that padding is gonna make a difference, but in RSA, it absolutely makes a difference. Uh, you absolutely <clears throat> wanna make sure that you are using uh, OAEP. And so the next part is key derivation, um, also known as password hashing. <clears throat> this is the part I, leave, I, I like the least. I hope all passwords die. Um, <clears throat> I, I work at a company where we're trying to kill them, uh, but they're not going to die today. So since they are there, we, we, definitely, need to <clears throat> we definitely need to do them right. Um, and, and password hashing, you should always use a key derivation function. Um, some of us might be familiar with bcrypt. It's been around for quite some time. Uh, PBKDF2 has been along for a long time. I forget what it is. Um, something based key derivation function 2. Um, a pseudo random yeah, based key derivation function 2. Uh, if you are currently using MD5 or SHA for hashing, um, you have a legacy system that you're working with, please, please, please use a random salt now. Right? Just add in a randomly generated value as a salt so that you can create some entropy there. <clears throat> um, and then make some plans to move to a key derivation function, uh, especially if you're building you know, devices that have a web portal or web access, or you have you know, a cloud solution that links to it. 60% of your users have the same password on their bank account that they have on your device. People don't want to have to remember passwords. People hate passwords. I hate passwords. You probably hate passwords. You probably have passwords that are used on more than one place. Think about your users. Your users are doing the same thing, and your users aren't as technical. They don't understand the risk, right? So they're, they've got it everywhere. Their bank is the same password. Their email is the same password, right? If I get your email address and you only have one, right? Most non-technical people only have one email address. I have everything. I can do password resets on your bank accounts. I can, it's just terrible things. Um, I can get access to any system that you might possibly have. And if you're using a very common bank, if you're using Wells Fargo, Bank of America, right? I'm in, because I can do a password reset fairly simply. So please, 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 key derivation functions. Um, so what key derivation does, is it uses salt for entropy. 
It's not an option. Most of them will, die, well, most of them will automatically generate it for you. Um, it iterates to increase cost, so it just keeps rehashing and rehashing and rehashing over and over and over again, um, usually re-injecting the salt. Um, and it doesn't make it, uh, I mean, it makes it a little less, uh, it obscures it a little bit, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is, is that it just takes time. You're trying with passwords, with hashing, you're trying to buy time. Um, when someone steals your passwords, if you've used a good key derivation function, unless someone has used one of the top 100 passwords, they will not be able to crack it. They will just give up. If they do have one of the top 100s, how much time that user has when, you de when you've been able to determine, especially in a cloud-based solution, if you've been, how, when you determine that you have been hacked, your users need those three days to go change their passwords. Right? A good key derivation function on the top 100 will, will give you up to three days to inform your users, hey, you need to go change your password. <laughs> you go change your password everywhere that you have this password. Um, and some of them, like I said earlier, create costs via threads and memory, and bigger is better, right? I have a, a mantra, which is hash till it hurts. Um, if you can, you can find a time that users don't think that there's something wrong with your system, but yet you're spending a lot of time hashing, that's good. Uh, I try and tell people half a second, right? Half a second, when you're talking about computing, that is an eternity. But when you're talking to a, a perception, half a second is nothing logging into a system, right? Whether it's a device, a website, if it took half a second to log in, you wouldn't think twice about it. But that half a second allows you to do millions and millions and millions of iterations, which means that every time an assailant has to do on a brute force attempt to try and regenerate it, every attempt is half a second, right? So if it's going to take them 10 million attempts, it's five million seconds they're gonna to have to spend on one single password to try and crack it. And it takes way more than 10 million attempts normally, right? So bigger is always better, and it makes a huge difference. Um, so w which key derivation function should you use? Argon2i is the new hotness, right? Um, it's been around for a couple of years now. It's vetted. It's starting to make it into uh, standard libraries for programming languages. Uh, it is it's actually fairly amazing um, because it allows you to use up additional threads. So one of the, the big password hacking tools out there is ASICs. Uh, very small um, <clears throat> processors that are very good at math, um, <clears throat> GPUs. But if you use up multiple threads, that means you have to use multiple GPUs because ASICs are single threaded. So you reduce the capacity to do cracking if you're using threads for um, password hashing. And if you're on a device, right, you can use threads. You're not, you know, if you're on a, if you're on a web platform, you've got something out there, threads are expensive. Uh, because you have all of these other people vying, you know, all these other requests are vying for, um, they're vying for uh, resources and processing time. But on a device, you don't have that. Um, so you know, Argon 2i is actually really, really good. Uh, it's a good use case for uh, being used on devices. Um, Scrypt is preferred. Uh, it actually uh, does time-based, so um, you can instead of trying to determine uh, what's going on as far as how long it should take. Um, so with a bcrypt, you would determine that, oh, I think about, you know, two to the 1,000th is about a half a second, where uh, scrypt, you can just say, just take half a second. Uh, and it will always be half a second, regardless of if, you're, if you have chip upgrades um, and your stuff goes faster, it's going to do more iterations. It's going to do it based on time. Um, and it is uh, fairly memory intensive as well. Uh, bcrypt has been around forever. Most of your programming libraries are going to have bcrypt. Um, or a, a library or module that you can use with it. And PBKDF2 is absolutely available on Linux because it's part of OpenSSL. So you will have access to OpenSSL and basically every embedded Linux platform, and PBKDF2 is there. It's not as easy to manage um, as bcrypt or scrypt, but it is secure. Um, it's not, doesn't, like I said, it doesn't uh, have the level of security, but like I said, if you, if you, if you can't get bcrypt or scrypt, uh, but you have OpenSSL, PDBKDF2 is there for you and absolutely ready to be used. Um, so if you don't have PHP, uh, you don't want to, um, it, if you, this is one of the places that, this is a great joke because PHP has been uh, thought of as the worst security platform on the planet. Blame WordPress, don't blame PHP. Um, but it actually has the best password management stuff on the planet. Um, and you can actually use it for IoT, I do that sometimes. Don't hate me, but 
I think it's kind of cool. Um, so in the key duration functions, it depends on your on what library that you're using, uh, what's going to be available. Right, Node has all four. Right, it comes by default. Node comes in its crypto package. It's got uh, PBKDF2. Uh, it has packages that are reliable that are encrypted to C that use Scrypt, Bcrypt, or Argon 2i. Uh, Python. I have not seen Argon 2i Python, um, but uh, I know that it absolutely has Scrypt and Bcrypt uh, and uh, Java has Bcrypt, I know for sure. It's, going to, it's likely going to have an uh, Argon 2i as well. So, and C is always going to be there, right? Because they write the ref, ref implementation in C. So that stuff's always going to be available to you. So um, every app is different. We all know that, right? Uh, but there are commonalities that exist across most applications. Um, I will only recommend that that I know that works. There are other things that are out there. Um, that work really, really well that I've never used in the field, so I'm not going to make a recommendation on that because I can't tell you um, if it's secure or not. I work on systems that we have ethical hackers that are trying to break into it every single day because we'll pay them if they do. I know these things work. I know that they're secure. Um, so if there's something that you think might be secure that's not up in here, it's not because it's not secure. It's because I don't know and I have not proven how secure it is. Um, and if you think that your application is different, right, where you need to use something that's non-standard, you should talk to yourself about, you know, do the advantages outweigh the disadvantages of doing something special and using some less than, less than vetted or less than secure cryptography method. So uh, recommended types, I'm going to use, recommend to use RSA um, asymmetric cryptography when transferring data. When you're moving things back and forth between people, um, RSA is going to be the most secure way to do that. Uh, you may need to mix it with AES uh, if your packet size is too large, or if you have an undetermined package size. Right? If you don't, if there's no way for you to absolutely know that it's going to be below 2K and you've got a 2K key, you may want to mix it up. Um, always, 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 always use cryptographically secure pseudo random number generators um, for keys. Um, so even if you're, you know, don't just come up with a, a word for a key, right? Just use dev random. Use something at the command line. Go to a web page that will generate it, right? You have cryptographically secure random number generators on the internet that will just give you a random value. Um, don't make keys things that are deterministic. Um, and always, always, always use argon 2i, scrypt, bcrypt, or pbkdf uh, for key derivation. Use the strongest cryptographic um, that you can afford, right? AES-256, CBC, SHA-256 is the minimum. Um, RSA-2048+, plus using... Uh, PKCS v1 OAAP and uh, with a shot to 56 for hash, hash until it hurts. Um, the packages are out there. Um, if you're using a language like uh, Python or uh, any language that's not C, use a library that wraps a C library, right? Um, don't use somebody's um, library that just kind of does it inside the code. That may sound really cool, but it's not the package that's constantly being updated and vetted, right? <laughs> Use something that wraps a known C library. Known C library. Um, that's it. Are there any questions? Okay. Well, lots. Yes. Um, you mentioned um, using temperature to supplement time. My perception was in most fairly full featured SSDs or chipsets, now there's actually dedicated entropy guard where you don't have to play tricks like that. I mean, there's a piece of hardware that generates noise. Correct. So what he said is there's. Uh, based on entropy uh, for generating random random numbers, cryptographically secure pseudo random number generation, that there are pieces of hardware that are built in, that's not always necessarily going to be there. Um, the operating system provides additional entropy, um, and it's all based on. I mean, if you're compiled for that chip, so what I can tell you is in Linux, it's going to use whatever it has available to it for that compiled chip set to generate good secure random good secure random number generation. Uh, whether that's using hardware that's installed or that's using additional information it can determine um, and because you know you may have chipsets that just don't supply that uh, but the operating system rely on the operating system to do that don't try and figure it out yourself on how to generate a random number well, for this audience don't rely on the operating system make sure your bsd port of the operating system is talking to your available hardware correct right and so his his the statement is to make sure that you your operating system is doing that properly um, don't just assume that it is and look into it because there are different operating systems that for the uh, embedded Linux stuff. Next question. Uh, unfortunately, most of the radios out there for the IoT at this point are only AES-128. What do you suggest? 
Well, when you're talking about radio transmission, what I what I don't do, it, it depends on what level of security you need to have. <clears throat> so well, even though obviously it's just link encryption at that right, point, right, right. You can always then put TLS on it, I assume. Well, you can always put just you can encrypt the data that you're transmitting. So it's just like, do you so, do you uh, trust CL, uh, do you trust TLS? Sometimes yes, right. If it's not data that is super secure, I will trust SSL going across. If it's not, I will encrypt the data that goes across the secure medium of the radio. Right, so you can encrypt the data packet that you're sending across the secure radio if you're concerned about the security level of the radio. I'm always concerned about man in the middle attack regardless. Um, so I definitely worry about that on, on what I build and what you build is certainly up to you. We've got 25 seconds. Another question? Yes? I mean, elliptic curve and RSA are, are fairly similar right now as far as strength. Um, So that, that's correct. So elliptic curve, you can get, it's, it's a smaller size key to get the, the same security. Um, there are some issues with reference implementations right now with elliptic curve. Um, and like I said, it's, but there's not much you can control about that. It, it is coming up and it is gonna be the standard, right? It's gonna overtake RSA just like RSA overtook the ESA. Um, and elliptic curve is what's used in RSA to um, actually generate your uh, shared secret when you're doing SSL, right? So it's out there, the Diffie-Hellman elliptic curve stuff is out there. Um, and it's going to be what comes up, but the tried and true, everything uses it, everything does it right for the most part, is RSA. And that, that's why I suggest it. It's not that there's anything wrong with elliptic curve as long as you have the correct implementation. Um, it's just that um, RSA is super secure, super standard to get used everywhere. And we're 40 seconds over. So I really appreciate your time coming out to a crypto talk first thing in the morning. Thank you very much.